You want to find that drive and focus that has you locked in and on fire every single day? My book, The Mirror Motivation, will do it for you. I bought a copy for you. You take care of the shipping. The book is free. Click the link down there. I got you. Stay all day. Stay all day. Work on my game.com. On the heels of the video I put out the other day that I know all y'all know about was at the Revolt Summit. Or at least if you're watching this, the Revolt Summit, the big uh, conflict, I guess we'll call it, between T.I. and Candace Owens. Killer Mike came in with some great points. We all know. And one of the major points in the whole thing that out of this 90 minute conversation that a lot of people seem to be talking about is when T.I. very loudly and brashly asked Candace Owens, is kind of rhetorically, when was America great? Trump says make America great again. And T.I. and people who agree with T.I. believe that Trump is a white supremacist. And he's pushing the thing of white supremacy. And his question was, when was America great? When Trump says make America great again, what period is he referring to? Candace Owens didn't really get a chance to say anything. And then uh, Killer Mike came in and he said, well, America was great at this period. He pointed out a certain period shortly after the Civil War when America was great for black people. Then some other people, I've seen a video. I was actually just before I recorded this. D.L. Hughley, a little clip, my like four minute clip, and he was saying America's never been great for black people because, and he points out all these things that have not gone in favor of black people historically or is going on right now. Here's the thing that I want y'all to understand. And I'm gonna answer this question. What does make America great again mean? What period is Donald Trump referring to, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanna take it from this level of America's never been great for black people because this thing, this bad thing, this thing, slavery, civil rights movement, these people got killed, MLK, Malcolm X, everybody already knows that. All right, so I'm not here to argue that point. And I'm not here to argue that it's wrong to say that America's never been great for black people. So I'm not disagreeing with DL Hughley or TI, and I'm not agreeing with Candace or Killer Mike either. Here's what I want y'all to understand. Make America Great Again is a campaign slogan. It's a sales pitch. Here's what you need to understand about that sales pitch and Make America Great Again. First of all, for those of you who don't know, Ronald Reagan used that same slogan in 1980 to win the election. Donald Trump just co-opted it and used it himself. And Bill Clinton actually mentioned it a couple of times himself when he ran for president in 1992. You can look that up and see it yourself. Donald Trump, I'm gonna say smartly, Utilize this slogan and I'm gonna explain to you why. And this is not an endorsement or support of Trump. I'm just telling you, I'm just judging his actions. I'm not judging him as a person or saying white supremacy is happening or not. I'm just talking about what specifically he did and why it makes sense. Make America Great Again is, a, is an open-ended statement because any one of us, America's been around since what, 1776? Is that when America won their, America won its uh, freedom from Britain, right? That is an open-ended statement that anyone who hears it can decide between, now I'm recording this in 2019, going back to 1776, you could choose any period in that time frame that you wanna to refer to, that you wanna help, you want to anchor to when America was great, so when he says make America great again, people are like, yeah, let's make America great again whenever that period was, however you decide. And you also don't have to pick a year. You could also just take it as him saying, when he says make America great again, another way of interpreting that statement is to say, well, that means America's not great right now, so we need to make some changes so that in the future it could be better than it is right now. That's the, the genius of an open-ended statement like make America great again. Because anyone could listen to that and say, all right, well, yeah, whatever it is right now, because the, the message, the unspoken message in that statement, and those four words, is that it's not great right now. <laughs> that's all, that's the only thing that you could, actually, I wouldn't even say that. It's back to the point that I'm making that is so open-ended that any one of us can interpret it any way that we want. The unspoken conversation in that statement is, we're not great now, we need to make it better. I'm taking what we are already doing and I'm offering something completely new because it's not great now, I'm gonna make it great again. Whether great was five years ago, 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, whatever we're doing now ain't good enough, I'm gonna make it better. That's what make America great again is saying. It's not saying white people, it's not saying about black people, it's not saying about civil rights or racism or supremacy or any of that, it's an open statement. So when someone here is make America great again and they start arguing, well, that's white supremacy or is not good for black people or this, that, and the third, there's two things that I want you to understand. Number one, there's nothing in that statement that says anything about race. 
There's nothing in that statement that says anything about one race being better than another. It's not. Now, whether you think Trump represents that is a different conversation. And I'm not here to argue that because everyone has their own opinion and everyone has their own belief. And for the most part, here's my second point. Everybody's already drawn their line, their line in the sand. When it comes to Trump and the Trump administration and whether you think he's a white supremacist or you think America's never been great for black people or you think it is, et cetera, et cetera, 99 percent of us. 99% of people watching this video right now, you have already decided how you feel about Trump, true or not true. You've already decided if you're for him, against him, you think he's somewhere in the middle, you're, I, don't, I haven't heard a single person talk about this who's open to changing their opinion about Trump and his administration, whether he's a white supremacist, when America was ever great or not great. So therefore, because of this, why are people and what I see just from my perspective and it's probably because of who I am and what I pay attention to, I'm seeing a whole lot of black people from the culture. And I use air quotes when I say the culture because I think a lot of people are pushing the culture to mean whoever's talking loud on social media. That does not represent all of black culture, but a lot of people are seem to believe that. And I think people who are not of our culture think that our culture is whatever's going on in social media, but our culture is much bigger than that. That's a different conversation for a different day. But I see a lot of people of the culture, quote unquote, arguing these points of Trump is a white supremacist. He represents this. He represents that. America's never been great for black people, this, that, and the third. But here's the question. Like, who are you convincing? Whose opinion are you changing? Like, who is open to a new idea or a new belief about Trump. Who doesn't already have one? <laughs> I think everyone's pretty much decided where they stand. They're either for or against with him. The great thing about as far as sales goes with a guy like Trump is that he's polarized everybody. Either you are with him or you're against him. Nobody's in the middle when it comes to Trump. You decided what side you're on and he, because of the way he presents himself, the things that he says and does, he has caused people to have to pick a side with him. You can't be neutral with the guy. And that's the the reason why I'm wondering why people are still arguing whether he's a supremacist and this, that, and the third, like, yo, everybody already agreed. Whether they, whether they agree with you or disagree with you, you ain't changing nobody's mind by continuing to hammer these points. And the other thing when it comes to the culture and black folks is that, yo, the same stuff that people are saying about him now, you were saying in 2015, 2016, when he was running his first campaign and he won. So what's changed since then? What's going to change to beat him in 2020 that's what i'm wondering because to continually say he's a white supremacist every time you say that and say he's bad for black people and this that and the third you're not changing anybody's opinion so the same people who voted against him then are going to vote against him next time and the same people who voted for him then are going to vote for him this time and every time you attack him all you're doing is making the people who support him be even more firm in their support so what's the strategy to beat him this time that's what i'm trying to figure out maybe you can get more people to come out and vote but I'm not quite sure that's going to work because remember Puff Daddy did vote or die in like 2004. All right, most people chose to die. All right, that shit didn't work. All right. And speaking of previous elections, Barack Obama, what was his campaign slogan? It was, yes, we can. Well, yes, we can what? Yes, we can start a business. Yes, we can go to school. Yes, we can elect a black president. Yes, we can play in the NBA. What is it that he's saying? Yes, we can do. He didn't say he didn't say what Yes We Can meant. It was an open-ended statement that any one of us, when you hear it, you can choose to fill in the blank with whatever you want. That's the genius of the slogan. So the same genius that Obama used in his slogan, Yes We Can, that's open-ended, you, you can make that mean whatever you want it to mean, is the same thing that Trump did in his, Make America Great Again. Great again from when? When was it great? When was the period that you're talking about? How are we going to make it great again? What's so bad about it right now? He didn't answer any of those questions. This is the genius of a slogan. This is the genius. Nike says, just do it. Just do what? <laughs> just do what? Go beat somebody up. Go commit a sexual assault. Go rob a bank. Go start your own business. Go make it to the NFL. Go say what you really want to say. Go propose to your, to your fiance and make her your, your boyfriend, girlfriend, make him your wife and, or her husband. What? Just do what? It doesn't say what to do. This is the genius of a slogan, ladies and gentlemen. This is the point that I'm making. When somebody comes up with a slogan and you're arguing that the slogan means this, this, and this, you're showing your ignorance when it comes to sales. You're showing your ignorance when it comes to persuasion. The point of a slogan is to allow you to fill in the blanks with whatever is already in your mind. I heard Jack Canfield, who is the author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, 
or one of the co-authors, the other is uh, Mark Victor Hansen, or they're the compilers since they didn't even write most of the material. That when someone says something to you, how you react to it, especially if someone says something benign or something that's open-ended, or even if somebody criticizes you, tries to say something bad about you or something good about you, it's like Velcro. Everybody knows how Velcro works, right? You got two pieces. You gotta have the, the little soft fuzzy piece that attaches to the, little, the harder plastic piece. And when you put them together, they connect to each other, right? Everybody knows how Velcro works. The way Velcro works, let's just say somebody criticized you and they said, yo, you're a bum and you should never, you shouldn't have this job. Wherever you work, you don't deserve to have that job. Now, if you take that and you allow that to make you feel, you feel bad, you feel down on yourself, you're sad and depressed for the rest of the day because of what this person said to you, that's because, as Jack Canfield explained, there was already something in your mind that believed what that criticism said to you. So when they said it, it stuck to that piece of Velcro from the outside, stuck to the piece of Velcro that was already in you that allowed that to affect you. But if there was no piece of Velcro within you that believed what that criticism was, it would just bounce right off you and go right back out there and it wouldn't affect you at all. So for example, if somebody said to me, you know, somebody said to me, Dre, you have, like Jack Campbell used this example, he said, Dre, you have red hair. I don't have any hair, all right, I'll shave, all right? So if somebody said to me, I have red hair, I would look at them like they were crazy, I may laugh it off and I would just keep walking because there's nothing within me that believes that at any level whatsoever. So if you you throwing that criticism at me doesn't make me feel any way because I don't have anything within me that believes it. But if there's a little piece in me that believes it already, as soon as I hear it, it makes me feel worse, makes me feel better. However I feel about it already before you said something, it's just, it's just gonna amplify it. That's what happens when someone says something to you. So when you hear an open-ended statement such as, it's just like in that movie, what movie was it? Was it Casino? I'm not sure if it was Casino, but uh, Joe Pesci, when the guy, I can't remember, maybe it was Goodfellas, y'all can correct me, whatever movie this was. When the guy said, Joe Pesci had made the joke, and then someone in the bar said, man, you're really funny. And then he looked at him, he got serious, like, funny how? How am I funny? What do you mean I'm funny? Am I just some clown that's here to amuse you? And he got real serious with the guy, and the guy started getting scared, and then he said, man, I'm just fucking with you. You know what I'm talking about? That was a benign statement. The dude said, you're funny. He told a joke, Joe Pesci told a joke, the dude said, hey, you're funny. And he took that as an affront, like a personal affront. How are you calling me funny? He was joking, but he was serious for a minute, right? Because there was something in his mind, if y'all just go along with the example I'm giving you here, that he took offense to someone calling him funny. Like he was too uh, self-conscious about being called funny. Like he didn't want to be taken as a joke. He wanted to be taken as serious. So when Trump says, make America great again, or Obama says, yes, we can, or Nike says, just do it, it's open. You can interpret that in any way that you wish. So if you take that to mean uh, white supremacy or let's hold black people down or let's bring slavery back, that's because you were already thinking that before he said anything. And to me, that is, I think it rings just a little bit, just a little bit of a victim mentality. And I, that I think since Trump has become president, I think some black people are stepping into this, is that this white man, and his white uh, cronies and teammates, if, if, if you will, they are somehow trying to bring us as black people down or black and brown people, non-white people, trying to bring us down, trying to push us out, trying to make things worse for us. And every time he says something, it's just more a verification that this is exactly what he's doing. And my question to that, anyone who believes that, is all right let's just say that that's true let's just say that trump is trying to bring black people down and push them down and bring back slavery he's trying to do all these things and make america great again is just proof that this is what he's doing let's just say that that's true now what all right so we're going to get on our our tv shows and our youtube channels and our instagram accounts and are on stages at panels and we're gonna yell about it and get mad about it and just keep reconfirming what your audience already believes, what is that gonna do? What, it, what is that going to achieve? That's the question that I've been trying to get answered for a while now. Every time I hear someone of the culture railing against this guy and saying that he's a white supremacist and he's this and this and this, and I'm like, all right, well, the people who listen to you already believe that. So you're not really change, you're not changing any opinions. You're not you're not giving anybody any new information. So why do we keep talking about it? The next step, as Killer Mike so eloquently said, and he had the right energy behind it to get through to the room that he was speaking in, was that all right? 
So we could sit here and argue about this all day, but what are we going to do for ourselves? If we're going to deal with politics, can we come to a politician and say, we want this, 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 and this, and this is our, this is our list of demands, and then we can move on from there. That, that's the next step, as opposed to us arguing about whether this guy is bad, or if he's good, or what this statement means, or what this slogan is supposed to represent, or if this guy's a white supremacist, or if he's not. Who cares? It doesn't even matter, because everybody's already made up their minds. So where do we go from here? That's the question that I want answered. So this video, the purpose of this video, I should have said this at the beginning, is to address what MAGA, Make America Great Again, what exactly does it mean? It means what you already thought it meant. Meaning that Velcro that was in your mind about Trump, about white people, old white people, uh, the history of America that black people seem to want to keep bringing up every time that Trump gets mentioned. Well, back in the day, black people, this happened with black people and this happened and this happened and this happened. It's like, okay, you believe that. That was already in your mind before Trump said a word. It was just that Trump triggered it in you. That's what they say nowadays, people get triggered. They hear a certain thing and it just starts to, it attaches to the Velcro in their mind. So when you hear people say triggering, all their, what they're referring to is the Velcro example that I gave you there that I got from Jack Canfield, is that you already had this idea in your mind about what certain things mean, all you needed was for somebody to throw that other piece of Velcro on there and it just sets you off. And then you start going on and going on. As T.I. at that Revolt Summit, he got triggered. He already knew, everybody in the room already knew what Candace Owens was about. That she was had been a supporter of Trump, that she was not a fan of Obama, that she was kind of not of the culture. I guess I think it's safe to say that, that she was not of the culture. And again, I've explained what I mean when I say the culture with air quotes, that she was not of the culture, even though she's black. And I think T.I. had a pretty good idea who she was before they got on that stage. <laughs> I think we can all agree to that, right? And I think he was just waiting for his opportunity to do exactly what he did. He took advantage of his opportunity. He absolutely did on his home court in his hometown of Atlanta. There was no way he could have lost that conversation. And he didn't lose the conversation, but we got to remember that wasn't a debate. It was supposed to be a panel, which is why I was so disappointed in the whole the circus that it became because it turned into like a rap concert with this guy trying to win points against somebody else when the whole a whole reason for the panel was let's have a constructive discussion to where we can come up with some what can we do as a group together because we're all black it's not about this side or that side or supporting this person or that person which again killer mike tried to say but i don't think it got through the heads of the people in that audience because i think ti had already gotten them Gave it, giving them what they wanted, which was a show. People came there for a show. The Revolt Summit, I mean, Puff Daddy's an entertainer. I said this in a video already. If Puff Daddy's doing an event, I'm expecting a show. I'm not expecting you no know, education. I'm not expecting learning. I'm not expecting some civil discussion about what's the next steps we take. I'm expecting entertainment because he's an entertaining dude. That's what he does. So that's not a knock on Puff Daddy. I'm a fan of Puff Daddy. He's a virtual mentor to me, even though I've never dealt with or met the man in person. So that's not a knock on him. I'm just saying this is who he is. This is what he does. And you come, you look at the Revolt event, an event that's a Puff Daddy event is going to be a show. It's not an educational event. It's a show. And that's exactly what we got. But anyway, I already talked about that. We need to rehash that. So I want to put this vid out here. And this is just off the top. So I didn't take notes or anything on this, but... Any of y'all got a comment, I'm sure I don't have to tell you what to do. You probably already wrote it before you even watched the whole video. That's that. Work on your games. Ray all day.